yeah we are it will be live in 10 30 seconds let me know when you're live so we should be live Uh, we'll start the event. Uh, welcome everyone. We'll start the event with the Tamita also. All right, welcome everyone uh, to this uh, uh, event today. Um, we are very uh, glad to like, you know, uh, present this event. Uh, this is the first event for this year from Metroplex Tamichangam Garden Group. Uh, I would like to invite John now to uh, introduce our uh, guest today and the topic. John? Yeah, thank you, Allah. Good morning, uh, everyone, and welcome to the MTS Garden Club home, home gardening session. And this is our first topic of this year, uh, home vegetable garden. And I would like to introduce our speaker, uh, Ruth B. Klein. Uh, she is from Dallas County Master Gardener Organization. Uh, Ruth is a certified uh, Texas Master Garden uh, from Dallas County, uh, Texas Master Gardener from, uh, as vegetable specialist. Uh, she's born and raised in Dallas. In 2006, she has decided to start her landscape in the small, uh, her small backyard. And uh, later in 2009, uh, she joined the Master Gardener program in Dallas. In 2010, Ruth's home landscape was chosen to be a city of Dallas waterways tour garden. Um, her current interest is focusing on community garden, community vegetable gardening, and she also helps to start community garden in. Temple Emmanuel in Dallas, where the crop is uh, donated to the local food bank for the people in need. And um, she speaks on various topics and various sessions. Um, she is a, she has she always shares her expertise with uh, on the topics vegetable gardening, fall gardening, spring gardening, water conservation gardening, and responsible gardening. Um, thank you for your time, Ruth. Welcome to our uh, um, garden club and. Uh, um, please share your expertise with our gardeners. Over to you. Hey, thank you for having me. Um, today is a good day to be sitting inside and talking about gardening <laughs> rather than outside freezing and, and uh, gardening. So um, gardening in Texas uh, is, let's see, I'll make sure. I'm having trouble progressing my screen, let's see. Oh, there, okay. Sorry, there's always going to be. Uh, uh, um, anyways, uh, growing uh, growing uh, vegetables in Dallas, it's you may be an experienced gardener, but um, doing it in this climate, I mean, the the weather here is crazy. I mean, uh, a week ago it was it was we were in an Arctic blast, and then and then it was close to eighty degrees yesterday, and um, just like just like we get confused, the vegetables get confused too. So it's it's uh, I went, when I first got into this, my husband said, "Oh, we could travel around the country and you can learn about uh, vegetable gardening." Well, vegetable gardening in Dallas is different from um, you know in this part of the country is 
is not like growing in any place else. So hopefully I can give you some, some tips on, um, I don't want my screen so crooked. Okay, um, I love this. This is from a book by, um, uh, 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 he was an extension agent. He said, nowhere but Texas are vegetable gardeners faced with so many bugs, blights, and soil maladies, not to mention drought and other weather related problems. Nothing makes a Texan matter than have someone from Connecticut or Illinois tell him how to garden. So that's uh, kind of what I was saying is that um, gardening. And then one of my favorite books uh, when, you know, I didn't, I didn't grow up gardening. I actually grew up, uh, I grew up, I, I was born in the 1950s and, um, you know, back then, it, you know, Wonder Bread and and canned vegetables were the deal. I mean, this, this idea of growing food was, it was kind of passe at that point. And I feel like I missed a lot, but I, once I decided to get into it, I was really excited about it. And um, this is one of my favorite books I read when I was reading it. And so it's, it's also, I, I got, uh, I retired and this guy, he was an engineer and he retired and he made a spreadsheet of all the, uh, the costs and, and uh, of all his supplies and everything. And he realized when he finished with it that each tomato ended up costing $64. So um, if, if you're doing it to save money on food, especially when you're first starting out, that may not be the right way to do it. So, so caution if, if, if you have this ideal that you're gonna um, be off the grid and live. You know, it's interesting too, during the pandemic, I've, I've been doing it kind of as a, a hobby, but during the pandemic, it occurred to me, um, you know, a lot of the grocery shelves were empty and stuff. And so it occurred to me that, <laughs> you know, I had never really had to grow food just uh, as a, a source to eat. And it occurred to me that um, having my own vegetable garden would be handy then. So um, preparation is more than half the battle. That's, that's um, and, and any, any gardening talk you heard from a master gardener is um, going to talk about this. And I'll, I'll go through it quickly, though, because every time you hear about gardening, you hear this and I get kind of bored hearing it. But, but um my, the main thing is, um, especially here, we have hard clay soil. I know if you try to put a shovel into the ground, it's, uh, it's not easy to dig into our earth. And the, and the key to, to um, amend is to amend the soil with compost. And so um, right here is a picture of me um, st stealing my neighbor's leaves. And um, it, it, the leaves, you know, they fall out of the tree in the fall and they're full of nutrients and people tend to put them out in the, um, on the front, on the, you know, like this is our heavy trash week, they put them out on the, the curb and all, they're just sending away all their nutrients. And um, this right here is something I discovered. I got it on, a, you know, on Amazon, but you can get it. Uh, it's a vacuum and it, 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 it cuts up the leaves and you just suck it up. And like I have area where leaves fall on top of rocks. And so it just gets the leaves without the rocks. And I mean, um, my background uh, is I'm a physical, I, my background, my professional background was as a physical therapist and raking leaves is, can, can be hard on your back. And this, you just suck them up and, and then just throw them in a compost pile. So um, that, that's one of my, my favorite pieces of, equi of equipment I've gotten. But what you, you, you really want to, um, you know, you can make compost or you can just go to a big box store and buy compost too. Um, composting doesn't have to be hard. I mean, what if you go to a composting class, which I've done, I spent a weekend in one and they teach you that you're supposed to, you know, keep um, turning the compost so it gets aerated. And um, I just, you know, especially like in the summer in Dallas, I'm just not willing to do that. That's too much work. So what, one of the things I've, uh, so, so I, everything I talk about, I've tried myself. So one of the things I love doing, um, I have an area where right outside my kitchen where I do vegetable gardening. And um, all through the year when I'm not growing vegetables, like all through the winter, this, this time of year, I will um, dig a hole and put my, um, my vegetable scraps into the hole and then just cover it up. And uh, sometimes I forget where the last hole is. So I had to start putting sticks up where I last dug. And then by the spring, usually the, the soil is really, um, um, you know, pliable. So that's a, that's a lazy person's way. Another lazy person's way that I, I read about, so I tried it myself, is uh, you can go to a coffee shop like Starbucks or whatever and get their coffee grounds and then um, put, take, you know, I just kept the plastic bags and I took some of my neighbor's leaves or my leaves and threw them in the bag and just let them sit there all season. And then I had compost from that. But like I said, if, if, if you don't wanna bother with all this, you can, um, you can um, go ahead and just 
just buy compost at a big box store. That's no, that's no problem. But um, I like it because I like, I like the idea of uh, not wasting, you know, like I, I eat a lot of cantaloupe and melons and potatoes and stuff like that. And um, I like the idea of not wasting, wasting all those scraps. And also my coffee grounds, I save those and throw them in the compost pile. So I like the idea of recycling with that and, and making use of, uh, you know, what, what what used to be waste and, and turning it into to something that's going to make the soil good. So that's composting. And um, because it is so hard to uh, dig into um, the soil, a, a good alternative is uh, raised beds. And um, you can do it like this is a community garden in uh, Grand Prairie, and they just took them, um, they took a concrete blocks and just made, uh, you know, uh, put them together to make the, the edging for it. And this is uh, the Temple Emanuel Community Garden. And we took them, um, we took a uh, four by four wood and, and created them. And I'm not big, I, I, I haven't had really good luck with um, container gardening, which um, uh, raised bed gardening is a form of, of container gardening. But I'll tell you what, when, when, uh, when you have flooding, like we've had these seasons, um, you know, Dallas weather is crazy. And we have these seasons where we have all that flooding. It's really nice having a raised bed because uh, usually the crops don't get destroyed from it. So um, another thing that the extension, the extension um, agents, uh, the, the master gardeners always recommend is to get a soil test. But if you're in the Dallas area, I can pretty much tell you what's on your soil test. And this is one we did at our community garden. And almost everybody, the nitrogen is extremely low. And that's, that's because we have clay soil and it leaks nitrogen easily. And what's high is phosphorus. So at the, you can't really read this here, but at the back of it, um, it says that only, only add high phosphorus, uh, add phosphorus to your soil every five years and nitrogen, we really wanted to up it. And so I'm real committed to um, organically uh, growing vegetables. And so I like to use like fish emulsion and stuff like that for nitrogen. That's one of my favorites is fish emulsion. So um, sunlight, that's uh, the sun is, that's where the energy comes from. And it's just some general ideas is, uh, you know, so if you're going to do a vegetable plot, don't do it under a tree. <laughs> But um, just some general ideas from the, the botany of plants is if you're trying to grow the, if you, what you're gonna eat from the plant, it's the fruit of the plant, which the fruit it can mean a squash, a tomato, a cucumber, that's the reproductive part of the plant. You need more energy and the energy comes from the sun. So like tomatoes and cucumbers, they need full, full sun in order to fruit. If you're gonna eat the leaves of the plant, um, then you don't need quite as much sun. You can get away with a little bit less sun. So, so like if you're going to do lettuces or herbs or something like that, you don't, you don't need as much sun. And uh, root vegetables are somewhere in between those. So you need, you need sun, but not as much as, as say a tomato plant, which needs full, full sun. So um, if you're going to choose where to grow your vegetables, uh, don't even think, if you don't have, if it, it's a shady place, don't waste your, your time and money and effort on it. You, you need to have sun. I mean, I remember when we did the Master Garden Program, we had bumper stickers that said trees are the answer. Well, trees aren't the answer if you want to be a vegetable gardener because you need, because they shade the sunlight. And also they suck out some of the moisture from the, the roots tend to suck out the moisture. So um, then if, if you don't have full sun, this is a solution. Like I said, I don't do very good with container gardening, but this, and this is a form of container gardening, but um, this, this, especially this season when I grew this, I, I grew a whole farm in a, um, in a wheelbarrow here. And I mean, I, had, I have cucumbers hanging over the edge and I've got greens and I've got some carrots in there and, you know, I can, in uh, lettuces and stuff like that. And the great thing about it is when um, in my yard, when the sun moves, I just move the uh, wheelbarrow over to the sun. Now, what I did is I had to find an, uh, I went to estate sales and found an old wheelbarrow and I, I drilled holes in it and then I filled it with potting soil. And then when an early freeze come, all I had to do is wheel it into the garage. It's kind of neat that it's that portable. It's, it's, it's kind of pretty too. A lot of times um, I'll do it in the, um, I'll plant it with flowers and things like that. It's kind of decorative. Um, so that's a, that's a cheap way and an easy way to um, deal with low sun area. So that's one of my, my favorite tips there. And then um, vegetables need um, consistent moisture. So um, if you, uh, 
you know, like one of my other favorite topics, I'm really, I'm really into conservation and doing what's best for the earth. And so really one of the crises in, in this area of the country is not enough water for all the people who are moving here. So um, the best, the best form of um, watering, which I'm not doing at home, I have to confess right now is, um, is drip irrigation. And um, I remember the guy, the extension agent was teaching us how to do it. He says, it's just like doing tinker toys. And I thought, well, I'm not very good at tinker toys, but it really wasn't that hard. We, you have this hard plastic uh, thing that you get from a, we got it from an irrigation shop. And then uh, I remember uh, it's real hard to get the pieces together. So we got a hair dryer to soften the plastic and then you just put them, you just put them together in the way you want. And then they have uh, little, little holes along there and then you hook it up to the hose and then it just goes through and it just drips down. So um, the advantage of this is that um, you're, you're not wet, like a sprinkler system just wastes so much water because it gets blown away or evaporates. And then also um, for the health of the plants, it's best not to water the plants, even though I remember I was at a church and they said, well, God waters the plants from above. But really um, what the biggest disease problem with plants are fungal diseases. And if you have a constant moisture, um, you're going to more likely to get diseases. So, so it's better to get the water close to the to the um, roots. Uh, you can go to a big box store and get a soaker hose too, and hook your um, your hose up to that, and just kind of weave it around the plants. That's something I've done. Um, and another thing too is to get a long handle watering stick that you you know you spray your hose, and then you just don't spray the leaves if you can. I remember there was a guy who at the Temple of Manu was a plant pathologist. And he said in the fall, he said, oh, there's always gonna be a lot of fungus on the plants. And he says, when you're, when you're watering from above, you're just spreading the, the fungal spores to all the other plants. So you really wanna try to go down to the roots. And one of my favorite things too is, um, is a, uh, I have trouble, like they say, stick your finger in to tell if it's, um, if it's the soil is moist enough because you want this consistent moisture. And I, after sticking my finger in, everything sort of feels the same to me. So they, you can get these really cheap, it's called a moisture meter and you just stick it in the soil and then it goes, it says, uh, they have fancy ones, but I like the one that says wet and dry. So sometimes the surface of the soil will feel dry to you, but if you stick this in, it's actually, full of moisture so you don't want to overwater things so I use this I use this with my house plants at home and and because uh, I've never gotten good using the finger technique so anyways that's, that's another tip for watering and then um, the other thing you want to use compost and you want to use mulch the one time uh, mulch is anything that covers the soil um, preferably something that's going to break down and also enrich the soil. And in, in this picture, we had, um, we had a bale of hay and we use that for the mulch. The one time you don't want to use mulch is, um, is when uh, you planted brand new seeds because um, part of the advantage of the mulch is, is that, that it um, shades the weed seeds so you don't get as many weeds in your, in your um, beds. But the, if, you're grow, if you're trying to grow a uh, uh, vegetables from seeds. You don't want to shade those too. So there's so many advantages. One of, one of them that I, you know, had never occurred to me, it, it, it modulates the temperature of the roots, which is helpful in the summer here. And then also uh, another thing is every time it rains, it can, it kind of crusts the top of the soil. And so the water, if, if, if you have a crust on the soil where it's compacted, the water can't get through to get to the roots. So what the, the mulch does is it keeps that, that banging, like we get these, these tumultuous rain, rain, rain downpours in Dallas, and uh, it keeps that from happening so that you don't get a crust on the soil. So lots and lots of advantages of um, using mulch. In fact, my, I remember my, my, we had a mentor when we did the Master Gardener program and my, my, um, my mentor looked at me, he says, the, the whole answer to gardening is just use compost and use mulch. So that's, that's for any kind of gardening. So then, um, then this, is, this is a time of year to be thinking about what you wanna grow. And there's different, you can, I, I get on these lists, I prefer just to go online. Um, and uh, do it, but uh, you can, there's different seed companies. You can just Google seed companies. And then they, this time in the winter, they send you catalogs and you can look and see the vegetables you wanna do. So you wanna choose the things that you'd like to grow. <laughs> I mean, like, uh, you know, my husband's not a big, it's not a big fan of uh, winter greens, which are so easy to grow here. And uh, they're so healthy too. 
So I don't grow a whole lot of those because he's not going to eat them. So, and, and then, you, you know, you realize you have to think too, that you're growing just, if you, if you are just like, we were going for a food pantry so we could grow as much as we want, but you don't, you, you know, you don't want more than you're going to eat or give away or whatever. It's fun to, it's, it's fun to, uh, my neighbor used to do that. He put a bag of vegetables on my fence and, and uh, you know, it, it's a wonderful gift to give to your neighbors if you have enough space to grow a lot. Um, if you don't learn anything else from my ta ta talk, I want you to remember this for successful gardening in Dallas is to you go online and you, you can search North Texas Vegetable Planting Guide. Um, and this, that it, it brings up this and timing is everything in Dallas. You've got to plant the plants at the right time. And the, the extension has done research of when the best times are. Of course, with global warming, it might be changing a little bit, but I follow this, you know, it'll say like snap beans, you can do from March 18th to April 15th. And so when you want to do them from seed, um, so I follow it. I follow it almost to the letter. In fact, I'll, uh, when I was leading the community garden, I would go down the dates and I, you know, when I was planning what we we're going to plant and I'd, I'd make copies of this and I'd highlight what we could grow that week. And so um, very, very important in, um, in, in Dallas, in, in, in Northern cities, you have a long growing season that, you know, it's like, it's kind of like you're on and you're off it, Free, everything freezes over in the winter and then you have the long growing seasons. In Dallas, you have two growing seasons. You have the spring and you have the fall because what happens is um, just like the rest of us in the summer here, we get, the plants go dormant. Once it gets to 80 degrees at night, a lot of plants will not fruit. So, um, and I, I'm gonna talk about some vegetables that you can do all summer, but most, most of the plants that people like to grow um, that are successful here go in those two, two short seasons. So that's why they have they have plants that you can plant in the spring, and then they have one for the fall. And like I said, this chart is for um, for uh, uh, this chart is is for the Dallas area. They've done they've actually done plots and researched it. That's the thing I like about. Um, I had a science major. My first degree was in biology, and I really like. Uh, you know, there's so many um, there's so many. Uh, you know, it's kind of like diet or exercise or anything like that. There's so many, so many anecdotal ideas about how to garden. And I really, I like, I want something that's done with, with um, peer reviewed um, research. I mean, that, and that's what I like about the master gardener program. Of course, you know, um, a, there's an art to gardening too, um, especially here, but um, I, I like knowing what the science behind it is. And what they've done too is they've, um, They've done they've uh, done tests on different um, vegetable varieties, and also you can um, you can you uh, Google vegetable varieties for North Central Texas, and this will bring bring this up of, of what are some of the best um, so uh, some of the best uh, ver versions. And most of them that are the best um, to grow here are short season because we have a short season. So in other words, when you look at a seed package, it'll tell you uh, when it's going to uh, go to fruit. And so I always try to choose the one where it goes the fastest, you know, from when you plant it to when, when it's going to um, grow. Uh, seeds, um, the main thing about growing seeds, a lot of people don't know how to grow seeds uh, uh, from seed. And the biggest mistake people make is they tend to uh, plant the seeds too deep. And so um, on the back of the seed package, it'll tell you how deep to plant. And if you're new to gardening, what I like to do is take a chopstick and um, right here, I, I have a mark for a half an inch, quarter inch, one inch. And I actually, especially with new gardens, it's community garden, I would have them poke a hole in it and then put it and go down to the, if it's at a half an inch deep, but go down to a half an inch and then put the seed in exactly there. After you've been gardening for a while, you don't have to be that specific, but that's just a, a good way to be sure you're not planting it too deep. Now, it's real important too, because some plants like uh, like lettuce seeds need light to germinate. So you don't, even, you don't even plant those under the soil. You just basically just sprinkle them out on top of the soil. So follow the seed package for that. And then another thing is to plan out where you're gonna put the plants. And um, the idea of this is like, you want the, the plants that are gonna, the sun is coming from the south. So you want the plants that grow real tall, like your okra or your vining plants to be on the north side of the garden. And then the shorter ones are gonna be on the south side of the garden. And this is really important. I remember when I was working, doing the community garden where people would have a plot and were new to gardening and they'd have an okra down on the south end. And then 
and it was shading the whole rest of the garden. So nothing, nothing else was really growing. So that that's just something to think about as far as light. Another thing too is if you're able to, I don't have much space in my home garden, but if, if you're able to, if you can kind of rotate families of plants, you're less likely to get um, as many diseases and bugs and things. Because uh, like uh, they, you, you like to keep the bugs and, and diseases confused. So, so um, like the soil gets, gets um, uh, infected with, with the diseases and stuff. So if you can rotate crops, that's, that's a good idea too. Um, right now, that's that's what I'm actually doing now. In fact, I'm, I'm tempted to, so I'm going to turn my computer right now. I've got my floor. I don't know if you probably can't see that. I got I got a whole a whole a trays of uh, new plants, little little babies on my um, uh, under a. I made a homemade light, and you can just use plain fluorescent lights. And um, I, I I took together I put together I found a, a design online, and I took um like a PVC pipe and I'm, I'm hanging a shop light from that. And then I've got all these little plants and I have to shut the door because my cat wants to come and, and use it for a litter box. If she, if, if my cat disturbed, I've been like babying these seeds from, from the beginning. And, and uh, if she, she messes, messes up my little babies, I'm going to, uh, we're going to have a cat stew for dinner. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> we're not. But, um, but anyways, this is, this is the time to grow a lot of seeds indoors. And in fact, like tomato plants, you can't grow from seed in Dallas because it, the season's too short. So I've got pepper plants growing and I've got chard and I've got kale and stuff like that. So it's easier to, to grow them where you can crawl. A lot of times towards the spring, it gets, I find a lot of times the plants do better, if you, if, like the kale and stuff like that grow better from seed directly into the garden. But um, you, again, if you're planting seeds, you want to keep the soil uh, evenly moist. And, and um, uh, actually, on, on the vegetable planting guide, it'll tell you the optimal temperature. And if, it, if the soil is too cold, it may be too cold for the plants to germinate. So one way to test that is to take a, uh, like a, a cooking thermometer, like a meat thermometer, and just stick it in the soil. And that'll tell you the temperature of the soil. I mean, you can you can you can do it this way, or you can just kind of um, wing it with things. But uh, really important, and this this is the hardest thing to do, is to have to thin out the seedlings, especially if you. I, I try I try to like put one seed in one hole if they're big enough. But um, you want to um, you've got to after you after they all come up, if they're too crowded together, none of them are going to grow. So what they suggest you do instead of trying to pull up the that'll disturb the other roots is just cut off the the weaker ones from the um, from the base of it so that one plant has enough to to grow and the seed package will tell you how far apart you want the um, to set, but it's really pain people just hate killing plants <laughs> so it's the least favorite uh, uh, chore for a lot of gardeners is having to thin their plants. So to larger seeds like squash and stuff like that, usually you'll, they do better, definitely do better. And root plants definitely do better if you directly do them into the soil. Things like I said, tomatoes and, and um, peppers and things like that, you almost have to uh, grow them inside. Or you can, you can go the other way and just buy the, the transplant from the garden center. And, and uh, But I don't know, I like the miracle of, of seeing it grow from seed. It's kind of fun. So I'm gonna go through the different seasons of what you can plant. Um, the only thing you can plant uh, up to February 15th, which this almost February 15th, are onion sets. Um, when you grow onions from seeds, you start them in the fall, but you can go to a garden center and get, they look like little baby onions. And then you just stick them in the ground. And um, then I'll tell you a trick to do too, is uh, if you have a, a, a cell phone calendar, um, look at look look at the instructions for that type of onion, and it, it's usually 80 to 100 120 days to harvest. What happens when when an onion's ready? It, the top of it kind of dies off, and so what I've done in the past is forgotten where I planted them, and then um, <laughs> so so the first year I did, then I couldn't find where my my uh, onions were, so a lot of them. And so one of the things I've learned to do is is put put a, a calendar reminder on my phone, and then to, so I can check them before they disappear. Um, so but like I said, they're ready to harvest when it turns brown and, um, or you can just harvest them as you go and have little green onions to put in your salad or dishes or whatever. And then kale and collard greens are considered winter greens. And um, 
they are, I love them because they are so easy to grow here in Dallas and they, they do really well. And um, you, you get a lot of bang for your buck on them. What you do, you do what's called a succession harvest them and, and you, um, you just cut off the, um, cut off the, um, the, the larger leaves at the base and then the, it'll sprout new leaves. So you just, it's just cut and come again. You, you have plenty of them. And the uh, people, folks at the food pantry really like these. And I've heard that um, <clears throat> winter greens, you know, they're, they're, you have to have a, a taste for bitterness, but um, uh, I've heard that it makes dietitians get dewy eye because they have so many good vitamins and things in them. So um, like collard greens and kale are, are two I really recommend growing in this area in the winter. They're definitely winter creams. They, they don't do well in the summer. So again, you wanna follow that chart, like I said. Let's see, let's see. Um, turnips, uh, turnips, that's another, that's not um, people's favorite, <laughs> favorite vegetable. It's if you know, like stuff like turnips, like they're root vegetables, I've learned to high heat roast them. I put them on a, um, I cut them into little pieces and, and put them on a, um, a cookie sheet and put them in the oven at 400 degrees with a little olive oil and salt and pepper and um, let them get crispy on the outside. And they're, I think they're delicious. I mean, uh, it's, you know, I, I don't like a mash and stuff like that, but again, the, you can eat the leaves and you can also eat the root of them and they're very easy to go. Um, and right now is a good time to, to plant them. Um, Carrots, carrots have very hard seeds, so they're hard to germinate. So I, I learned a method that uh, you might want to try that's kind of fun. You, um, you make a slurry out of uh, cornstarch and water, like about, you put like about a cup of water and um, a tablespoon or two of cornstarch and make a slurry like, just like if you were gonna make gravy. And then um, very important, you let it cool out, cool off after it gets kind of gelatinous. Um, one time I didn't cool it off and I killed all my seeds. And then you put it in a Ziploc bag and um, you uh, uh, leave a little bit of air, uh, the open opening so that it gets air and then you wait. And then when the little, um, the little root starts to come out, that's when they're ready to um, plant. And two, one of the things that, um, that for one thing, this, this, one of the big problems with planting is because the seed is real hard. Um, they're hard to get them. You have to really keep them moist. So if it dries out at all, it kills them all. And this way, um, the, the gelatinous material around the seeds kind of keeps the moisture in and they've already germinated. So you don't have to wait so long. So it kind of extends the season. And um, very important, um, so this is it's funny because these two girls at the garden, they're both chefs actually. And so what you do, you take the plastic bag and you, you cut a little hole just like you're gonna pipe in a, a, like a frosting or something like that. And then you just pipe it onto the soil, you know, um, just at the recommended uh, depth, which isn't very deep for carrots. And then, and then um, sure enough, they, it works really good. They come out really great. Very important with root vegetables like carrots, you need, um, you need very um, pliable soil because it, the you know, root has to grow down into it. So you have to, you know, you need a lot of compost in those beds so that they're not, if there's any hardness at all, you want to get, get a good one. And again, um, the kind of carrots that grow best here are the shorter ones. Um, they make these French ones that are kind of round. They usually, of course, we had good luck with that one. That, that one, that one didn't prove my point, but um, that, that, that's, a, that's a, another trick with carrots that I like. And so um, then the, what they call cold crops, which are broccoli and cauliflower and when I start growing these myself, I, I realize why they're expensive at the grocery store. I mean, like a cauliflower takes months and months to make a big cauliflower. This is one that um, I think we got the transplant from a garden center that uh, is a special breed that's um, colorful. And one of the things I have learned from dietitians is that um, the more color you have in the vegetable, the more nourishment they have. So probably it's, it's better for you than, uh, I mean, I don't know the science behind it, but, but it's, you know, they, they have any uh, flavonoids and antioxidants and stuff like that. With broccoli, um, you do, you mostly get one big um, broccoli stock, but uh, if you cut that, a lot of times you'll get uh, side, side shoots of little broccolis. So you get, you get a bigger, bigger bang for your buck from broccoli than you do from cauliflower. Um, another thing to know about both of those is that the leaves, the leaves taste a lot like winter greens and they are edible. So it's a shame that a lot of people just toss the leaves. You can 
cook them up or do whatever you do, you know, stir fry with them or do whatever you would do with greens. So that's another tip on that. And then um, Swiss chard, um, you know, uh, you can grow it now. Now's the time to be, you can uh, direct seed them. I wouldn't do it today. It's a little cool today, but um, it's just the most um, easiest to grow here. And it's from the beet family. And so um, you, you uh, like there, it's supposed to be an annual where you only get one crop, but I, I've had some, um, some uh, chard plants that, you know, kind of die down over the summer. And then one, one time they made it three years and I kept getting more leaves and more leaves. Um, so, and they're real pretty. They have varieties that have uh, red in them and stuff. So they look pretty if you put them in your flower beds too. So, um, and also they, they don't, they don't tend to um, bolt or bolting, meaning they don't turn into flowers and get bitter. So, um, so that, that, that's, that's another one I highly recommend growing in this area for, um, and they're good. You know, you can, like, I like to stir fry it with a little garlic and, and um, you know, it, very healthy for you, very healthy. So another good one. And then lettuce uh, is a, you know, it's, it's frustrating to me because I like to eat salad in the, in the summer when, you know, I don't, I like to have, you know, stews and vegetables and hot vegetables in the winter, but it's, a, it's considered a, um, a uh, winter vegetable here because they, they don't like the, um, they don't like the, the heat, you know, they, they do have some varieties that are, they, they come up with some varieties that are more heat resistant, but, but they don't still don't do very good. And this is my front porch. I just, this is a grow box and uh, you fill, you fill the water in right there. And then it has kind of a pool of water. I, like I said, I don't really like container gardening much because it's, it's hard here in Texas, but uh, this does, did really good. So it was kind of nice. I could, I could go out and, you know, when I did have salad, go cut my salad and then right on the front porch and then bring it in. And then I, I, I love this picture. This is the only one that's not from my garden. I, I have permission to use it though, but somebody just took a, a potting, potting mix and um, you take a fork or something and, and make drainage holes in the bottom. And then you just sprinkle the, 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 the um, seeds on top. And then, you know, if you have no space at all, voila, you've got a garden right there. So there's your salad. I remember with a wheelbarrow a garden, one of my uh, friends, I posted a picture on Facebook and he says, gosh, Rishi, you could just wheel the wheelbarrow into your dining room table and people could just cut their vegetables off of that. I thought that was kind of neat. <clears throat> so radishes, um, supposedly, I remember when I did the vegetable specialist program, the fellow who was teaching it, he says, if you can't grow radishes, we can't help it because they're supposed to be really easy. Well, a lot of times I have trouble growing radishes, but um, the, the advantage of them, they're, they're extremely short season. So if, if you grow, uh, if you grow a broccoli or something, um, it's a smart idea to sprinkle radish seeds around that because you'll have like two or three crops of uh, radishes by the time you, um, by the time you get one broccoli or one cauliflower. But um, the, the trick to growing radishes, I, I'm sure not only having the, because it's a root vegetable, having real pliable soil is to uh, thin them as soon as they come out. You got to get your scissors out. And, and uh, people, you know, people at the community garden ask me, well, how, how far apart do you put them? And I said, well, envision a radish and leave enough space for the radish. So you've got to cut off the, and you, it's, it's, it, you got to, you got to decide which ones looks like the strongest one and cut off the weaker ones. And that way, usually you'll be, you'll be more, um, you'll be uh, more successful with them. And radishes, you know, they're not the favorite vegetable. Like uh, one of the girls who was a chef, she, uh, she, she studied in France in cooking and she likes to, um, she'd like to uh, saute the radishes. She cut them up and saute them in butter. And the radish greens are also edible. Like all, any kind of greens are usually really healthy for you. So, um, Anyways, that's radishes. Rad radishes are great because they're, uh, like I said, you, you, uh, they're quick. And then there's mustard, um, which I, I definitely, mustard, uh, the seeds are hard again and, and um, they're not very tasty, but they're really pretty. They have, they come up with these red, red varieties of mustard and stuff. So they, they if you, if you have flower beds that you can like border them with mustard. I remember my neighbor next door said, he go, Ruth, if you'd stop growing, I, this was before I got into vegetable gardening, she said, he said, if you stop growing all those weeds, we'd have something good to eat. So, so now in my flower beds, uh, I grow some pan, I don't have any flower beds, but I, I grow some pansies and I'll, I'll usually border them with mustard or chard. 
And um, an advantage of these two, it, it is a winter green, but uh, you can grow it, uh, it, it it's, you can go when it starts getting hot, it, it doesn't start to flower as, as uh, early. And then herbs are easy to grow. And I, have, I, love, I love it that, um, you know, if you go to the grocery store and buy herbs, like if you have a recipe that calls for sage or something like that, I mean, it, you, can buy, you can buy a transplant for the amount of that little thing and then you have it all season. So um, you have winter herbs here and you have summer herbs here. So like uh, parsley does not do good in the summer here or cilantro is a winter, winter herb. So it may like if, you, if you're, you know, like a lot of Texans here like to, like to do uh, uh, salsa, you know, where you have cilantro and tomato, well, they, they all come, they don't, come, they, uh, they don't get harvested at the same time. So, so if you really were depending on your own garden here in Texas, uh, you wouldn't be able to make uh, salsa if you could go to the grocery store and get the things. But the uh, cilantro, I let it reseed. I remember one year, my hope it was between the where the grass was growing. I had cilantro all over the whole yard, so I use a lot of it that in my cooking. And then, uh, of course, uh, the Mediterranean herbs are summer ones. Um, the uh, rosemary, uh, rosemary does really good. Like those, you know, rosemary gets to be a big bush here, and um, especially when we have droughts in the summer, it's usually one of the most successful plants there is. Um, but uh, and then basil, a lot of people, I'm not as crazy about the stuff you make with basil, but um, one of the things you have to do with like basil is pinch off the ends of it at least weekly because it, it, once it starts flowering, the, um, which is the word bolting is the word, it, it, it starts to get bitter. So, um, and again, uh, also uh, herbs don't need as much sun because you're eating the leaf of it. So, so if you have a place that's partial shade, um, there's no such thing as shade vegetable gardening, but if you got like a, less sun, that's a good place to stick your herbs. And then um, the winter, I mean, most people, most people who take up vegetable gardening, they do it just because they want to eat tomato, fresh tomatoes or something. There's nothing like a, to me, a fresh tomato from the garden. I mean, it's just like the sun is put in that. I mean, I love it. That's one of the reasons I took up gardening is, is to grow my own tomatoes. The problem here is again, they're very, they're very picky about, they're hard to grow here. They're very picky about uh, timing. So you need to follow the, uh, the guide that I was telling you about. And then um, the earlier you grow them, a lot of times the more likely you are to have success because really once it starts getting warm, they start stop making pollen and they just stop growing and they don't grow in the summer here. So um, the problem though is, is if you grow them now, you usually start them in March, but uh, oftentimes we'll get a late freeze. So this is a trick that I learned, and this may be worth the, if you do grow tomatoes, this may be worth just sitting through this course today, is to um, take, a, uh, take water bottles like this and put, put one water bottle on the north side of each plant. And then when the freeze is due to come, cover it with uh, frost cloth is ideal, but any kind of cloth that uh, keeps the wind from getting on it. And uh, what happens is the uh, sun comes down on the water bottle and kind of makes, uh, heats it up a little bit. And then that, that water bottle sort of keeps it from freezing at night. And I've actually tried it and it really has, you know, kept the, the tomatoes from freezing. Um, again, with tomatoes, very important, like big tomatoes uh, don't do well here. You want small, you, like the easiest kind to grow are usually the little baby, uh, baby tomatoes, um, the smaller ones, cocktail type tomatoes. So you want real short season tomatoes So um, if, to have success with those. And um, like I said before, uh, tom tomatoes need full, full, full sun, not a bit of shade or they, they won't fruit. I mean, that's one of the main problems. If people have, tr if their plant grows real big and um, you don't, you're not getting fruit, one of the main reasons you're not doing it is um, because you, you don't have enough sun. So very important. So uh, those are the dates. April 30th is a little late. I probably wouldn't do it, but um, March 1st is the first day. So I usually try to get them in as early as I can if I'm willing to, uh, to deal with covering them. And I, I did grow my own, I, I used to start it from seed now, I just, because I'm only just growing for my husband and I, and I don't really need that many, so I'll, um, I just buy the transplants now and try to pick the ones that are a shorter season, like I said. And then green beans um, do okay, they're, uh, again, that's another thing you can start in March, you, you grow in, um, anything that grows up a vine, you have to do later because it freezes, uh, it's not going to do well. Um, 
the, an advantage of planting green beans is uh, any kind of legume actually helps to, uh, they have a little uh, symbiotic relationship in the roots with um, th that uh, with these little uh, bacteria that, that uh, fix nitrogen from the, um, from the atmosphere. So it's good to grow in between other plants so that it helps to fertilize the soil. So um, that, that's true, uh, that's a good reason to grow green beans. I have, I, I tend to get a lot of uh, fungal disease on my green beans, so I, I've lost favor. Plus uh, my sister used to come over, she'd want a farm to take, she thought it was real fun to have a farm to table meal. And, and, I mean, like it's, it, I, I'm getting a little lazy in my old age. I mean, it's so much easier just to go and get one of those microwave bags full of <laughs> green beans. Cause I mean, you know, like it, I, she'd come over thinking I'm gonna whip together a farm to table meal and I'm still the all afternoon. Uh, harvesting the green beans and stringing the beans and stuff like that. So um, I've gotten a little lazy with green beans. Um, then uh, squash, uh, cucumbers. Cuc I, lo I, lo I love cucumbers. I mean, they're um, in March 18th, the earliest you want to grow them. And the thing about cucumbers um, is they have to be pollinated. Um, and uh, so you need bees or uh, flies or butterflies or something. And uh, the deal is what happens is the first, the first flowers that happen are the male flowers. And how do you tell the male flowers from the female flowers? Is the female flowers have a little baby cucumber at the base of them. And the uh, male flowers are, just, um, uh, are just, just the flower by itself. So in order to, if, if you don't have a lot of pollinators and, and you're having trouble, uh, if, if, you don't get, if you don't get fruit from your plants, it's probably because it hasn't been pollinated, but what you can do, and when I first heard about this, I thought there's no way I'm going to bother with it. But it's really not that hard to do. You just take uh, you take one of your male flowers and you just rub it into the to the, air, the center area of the female, and then that pollinates them. Some people take a Q-tip, but I think it's easier just to take the flower and and you just go with each one, and and uh, you you can be the you can be the um, the pollinator, and that works. I mean, it, it really does. If, if you're having trouble getting, if you have enough bees, and I think another thing is plant. Um, uh, you know, flowers that attract the butterflies and bees and things like that. And, and then they'll, the, the bees will take care of it for it. You don't have to worry about it. Peppers, peppers tend to do really good here, especially hot peppers do great. Um, and they, they tend to, um, uh, in, uh, later in the, in the summer, they, they tend to get hotter and, and like jalapenos, stuff like that. I, I don't have, I, I, I uh, don't like real hot foods. So, so I don't grow those, but, um, uh, you can start planting them like I've got them um, started inside right now on the floor here you know, under the light and then um, they, you know they tend to they, they tend to do great here I mean they're, they're and they're fun to grow and they're pretty and I mean look at look, look at that beautiful picture of, that's from our community garden I took that um, so uh, peppers are, are like uh, they're, again they're you know it's they, they need a lot of um, nourishment so you probably need to side dress them with them um, with uh, uh, organic uh, fertilizer as you grow them, and um, the, if you if you want peppers to be hotter, what you do is you deprive them a little, let them dry, really dry out between um, waterings, and um, that's one of the ways the pepper uh, protects itself is by making the capstation, and um, uh, it, it's a reaction to stress. So you want to stress them a little bit so they get hotter. I don't want them to get hotter. I, mean, I, like, I like sweet peppers better. Um, I remember uh, grow, uh, squashes. Um, this is this is actually a picture from our community garden at Temple Emanuel. Um, when we did the specialist uh, program, the, the guy who was teaching, he says, "Why do you want it? Why do you do you want to? Um, the reason you want to grow vertically is because the uh, the uh, uh, plants or the, the bugs are afraid of." He said, "Bugs are afraid of height." And, and we all went, ah, ha, ha. He says, no, really, why would the bugs be afraid of heights? Because their main predator are birds. And so if they're, if they're up high, they're more exposed to the birds. So what we did is we, um, like a big, a big squash like that one, what we did is we had all the women um, collect all their brassiers and, and hoses and things. And we, um, we hung them up, you know, we, we tied them up to the fence here. And um, the the stem of the squash will get thicker with the with the stress of the weight of it, but usually if, for a big one like that, you, you need you need your brassiere or whatever. Um, but uh, they do great. Now, a big problem in Texas is squash bugs, and, and what I have to do if I get squash bugs, I just have to not grow them one season to to um, make the area less interesting to the to the squashes. 
okra did great in um, in uh, they did great in the summer in Dallas. Um, so that's that's another one. The deal is you, you got to keep you got to keep uh, harvesting or, or if they get to they need to be about the length of a finger a long finger. If they get any bigger, they're they're um, get too hard. I mean, you can't boil them enough to make them soft enough. So, and they're real hard to find when you're um, you're harvesting them. I mean, you have to. I remember there's one girl at our community garden who was really good at eyeing them. We'd go, all go through and we wouldn't see and then she'd find another one. So you need to uh, harvest them frequently. But that's that's one of the vegetables that grows good in the summer here. And sweet potatoes. Um, this, this is a, I, one year I started my own sweet potatoes. I just went to the, uh, I went to like Sprouts and got some organic sweet potatoes. I re recommend you get uh, seed potatoes from a garden center, but these are fine. I just, I poked, a, a, you know, like little sticks in them and then let them grow roots. And then these these things grow a little, that looks like little vines growing out of the side of it. And that's what you plant is a little vine. And then it grow, ends up looking like that. And um, some sweet potatoes, you can eat the, um, a lot of the Asian communities. Uh, at Vickery Meadow, we had a lot of a Asian communities that were making use of the services and they love the um, sweet potato vines, that they're, especially when they're young and the tender shoots they'd stir fry with them. And it makes a good ground cover too. I mean, like if you see ornamental, it's sweet potatoes, you end up getting a sweet potato, but those have been treated with stuff, so I wouldn't eat those. So then you, so it's, it's a good plant, even though it, it takes all season from to grow, like you don't harvest them until the fall, but, um, but you end up, you, you know, you, you would, can cut off the, the tender and use them while it's growing. And then you end up with the sweet potatoes. And the kids at Timbal Manual loved, uh, Harvesting, it's fun to it's fun to also you know pull up all these sweet potatoes. So you after you harvest them, you leave them out to what they call cure, and then and then uh, and then you eat them. I love sweet potatoes. Now you, you can eat sweet potato vines, but it's it's a tropical plant. It's a completely different plant than um, white potatoes. White potatoes, if you eat them, uh, they're poisonous. So don't eat those. <laughs> so just so you know. And then there's some um, Asian um, vegetables that do really well here in Texas. Um, these are the red noodle beans. And I, you know, when you cook them, they taste a lot like green beans and they don't get nearly as many diseases as green beans do. That's why I'm kind of down on green beans. And also they, they fix nitrogen in the soil and um, they, uh, they, you know, they, they do great and they, and they go all summer. I mean, you can, you can plant them all summer. Other things you've got to do it because they like the heat. So that's, that's another one I recommend. And you can get them from like uh, one of those seed catalogs like Baker's Creek. You could just Google uh, red noodle beans and then you, could, you can bring up a catalog. And then this is, uh, uh, this is Malabar spinach. And it, it's, it's, you can't, spinach is a winter vegetable here. And I, I tend to get a lot of diseases. And so I just buy my spinach at the grocery store. But um, this, this, this is, it's kind of pretty. It's a vine and it's a, but I don't, it has kind of a waxy taste to it. it they are edible. And then these berries turn a deep purple and some, some communities actually use the berries to make dyes or some. So it's, it's fun to grow. I mean, it's not my favorite one, but and it's really easy to grow here in the middle of the summer. And then um, let's see. Oops. Let's see. Uh, the bush worm. Then um, uh, bitter melons. Uh, I don't know. Do y'all? I, I, I've heard that in Indian cuisine they use bitter melons. Um, I to me uh, they're too bitter. So that's how they. But they they really uh, they vine. They're beautiful. You have to grow them up over an arch or a vine. And I remember one one fellow at the garden. He says that uh, he goes. I, I'm going to renew my wedding vows under the bitter melon <laughs> vine with his wife. Um, but they're easy to grow. Like the summer, like the heat, you can grow them all summer too, which is is in the, in the tropicals. And then um, the snake melons also. Um, you can, uh, a lot of people say it's kind of like, uh, almost like zucchini, you take the seeds out of it and um, they, uh, you know, they, they probably, I bet, I, bet, I bet they use that for, y'all can probably tell me that. I don't know if they use it for, it's not a common vegetable here in the States, but it, it grows great in Dallas. And then, um, let's see, is that Malabar spinach? So um, what, kind of in summary, if you want a garden, you need to, you need to, it's, it's a full-time job. <laughs> I remember my father grew up on a farm and he couldn't wait to get out of that farm because he had to milk the cows every day and 
stuff like that. So, you know, I mean, and there's a saying I love 80% of success is just showing up. You've got to show up to check on things and, and uh, check on bugs. And speaking of bugs, here is a, a it's called a cabbage looper. And this is uh, uh, if you're, um, if some of your, your, like your collards and stuff like that start looking like Swiss cheeses, because these beautiful white butterflies, and they come out when it starts getting warmer, which in Dallas it's warm, and it's cool, it's warm. And, the, and they look really pretty in the garden, but they're laying eggs. And then these, on the bottom side of the eggs are these little green worms that eat holes in your thing. And um, I'm not big, I don't like to even use organic pesticides. I just smash them, you know, if I find them, I don't, I don't worry about it. And uh, integrated, I love integrated pest management is one of the things I learned from the Master Gardener program. And um, this is a perfect example of it. If, if you just leave things alone, like these have aphids on, they're little white sucky things that, that suck on the leaves. If, if there's not too many of them and you leave them alone, the little ladybugs will come and dine on the aphids. So if you, if you just kind of let things take care of themselves, um, uh, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to fix everything in the garden. That's one thing. A lot of people, a lot of people, they, they want a, a cure for everything. It's just, just, you know, let, let nature take care of it for, for the most part. And I, li I like this is something is eating your plants and your garden is not part of the ecosystem. And, um, the uh, I, I, I heard a story in Japan that if, if there's no holes in the leaves of the vegetables, a lot of people in Japan won't eat them because they feel like it must have something on it. If it's not attracted to the bugs, it's also not attractive to me. So especially now, like I, I'll take a lot of my greens and they'll have a lot of holes in them, but I, I stick them in with my soup or whatever, and I don't know the holes are there. So I have more of a laid back attitude. And this is, this is the uh, tomato hornworm. And it, oh, I mean, it's a huge, big thing. And again, my uh, favorite, favorite uh, solution for it is just you know, pull it off. You'll find their, their frass, it's called, which is their excrement on the ground that you look up and they, they look just like part of the plant. I remember one, 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 one uh, cabbage looper got ahead of my tomato plant and the next day it comes out looking like a, like just sticks, there's no leaves left. And I mean, I ate the whole plant in one night. I mean, they're really, it's like eat, you know, Pac-Man or something like that. And then, um, you know, there's different approaches. You can, if you're an engineer, you can take the square foot uh, gardening. I don't know, my, my, my uh, screen keeps progressing itself. Approach where you, you, you divide up a thing and then you figure out how many per square foot you can do. And that's not my, my I mean, I tried it because I like to try everything I'm going to talk about. We make squares and, like you could have 16 radishes in one square and one broccoli and two, you know, four squares. And uh, it's a real organized way of gardening. It's, it's a good way to, it's a good way to, um, when you first start gardening, it's a good way to kind of learn about it. But um, I'm more, I read, I read about this in the paper, chaos gardening. And on this, they took a bunch of toddlers and it spired seeds and they had the toddlers throw the seeds into the ground and uh, they got great results from that. So. So you can you can you can be anal retentive about it, or you can just kind of do chaos gardening. And I'm somewhere in between, but I, I I'm more towards chaos. I mean, I just, I, just, I just don't like to be that succinct. Um, and then my biggest problem with growing like tomatoes and things like that are squirrels. I live in an area with a lot of trees, and um, we had squirrels at our community garden. And right here, what we did one year, we grew uh, cantaloupe or melons. And the squirrels got in and, and just binged on every last one. So the next year we took a, we had the loop here, which we tie into the side of it. And then we just put chicken wire in it and uh, they weren't able to get in. I know I've tried everything. I mean, I hate squirrels. I've tried everything. This is a motion detector thing that hooks up to my hose. And so when something goes in front of it, it squirts this real hard uh, squirt of water. Um, but the squirrels are smart enough, they can get around it. So it didn't really work. But I'll tell you what, I had a neighbor, I don't have a fence in my yard. And I had a neighbor who had chickens and the chickens would come over and eat my greens. And I mean, those, those chickens got squirted a few times and they never came back. So it worked for the chickens, but not, not squirrels, which is my intention. So I spent, I spent like a, a lot of money and had a, 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 a cage built. And, and uh, since I've done that now, I, I, I get I get a full crop of tomatoes. The squirrels haven't gotten in. I've had it for probably eight or eight years or so. And um, 
And my husband, when we found out how much I spent on having this built, he, he said, well, this is going to be more than $64 tomatoes. And I said, it's worth it. It's just so devastating to grow the little tomatoes from seeds and then have the squirrels, you know, it's like the squirrels don't find them for a while. And then like one squirrel must find it and go tell all his buddies and then your tomatoes are all gone. So I've, you know, this keeps the chickens out. And, and one time uh, the door got, got shut and I couldn't get out. <laughs> so, so, so it was almost like a cage for me. Luckily, luckily I figured out a way to get out of it, but, but um, that was worth the money for uh, investment. So when you, when you harvest again, you have to be careful, like with broccoli and stuff, uh, what what it is what what what's happening when you when you create a fruit it's a reproductive and it goes to a flower then it's um it's trying to make more of itself so once it flowers everything gets bitter so you have to you have to you have to harvest before it gets bitter now with uh, onions too since in, a lot of times in Dallas because since our temperature varies so much you'll get these little bulbs on the top and once you've gotten that you need to go ahead and just carve harvest you, you can, uh, we tried cutting it off. It doesn't make a difference. You got to just go ahead and harvest it and eat it as an immature. So it's just like, you have to really be like, it, it, you'll see with the broccoli, what happens is the broccoli stuck, it, it's about to make a flat, you know, it makes these beautiful yellow flowers. But once it flowers, it's not good to eat. So you have to, like I said, you have to, if you want to garden, you got to be in the garden, you got to watch before it, it does work. And so um, I love this from uh, one of the extension agents. One of the most affir affirming and enjoyable things about gardening is the fact that we keep getting another chance to get it right. If you know, planting fails, just pull it up and replant. Each season is a new chance to learn, to experience, and to gain expertise. There are very few things in life where you can fail so miserably and just start over again with a clean slate. So um, that's, you know, it's like gardening is kind of like life, you know, it just, uh, you know, if it doesn't work, you just try again. So, um, you know, is it worth it? You know, like the 64, it's worth it to me. I mean, this is, this is like a little still life from my garden one year and uh, including the rose. And it's just so satisfying to see things from, you know, just see the cycle of life and the experience. It's so different from, like I said, when I'm growing up on eating Wonder Bread and canned vegetables, you know, to actually know where the vegetables come from. It's a wonderful thing to teach children and things like that. So then, Anyways, uh, if you have questions, um, the Master Gardeners, it's a program that's uh, paid for by you know, your tax dollars, is the Dallas County Master Gardeners. And if you, uh, I use them, like the, the, the people who are working on the, what they call the help desk are really trained to problem solve problems with your garden. So you can, um, you can email them at dallasmg at ag.tamu, which is uh, Texas A&M University.edu. And then what I'll do is if I have a problem too, I'll, I'll, um, I'll take a picture of it and um, put that in the email and then they'll get back with you with their suggestion. And then um, also uh, you can get to that site too by just going to dallascountymastergardeners.org and they, they've come, just come up with a beautiful new um, uh, website uh, that and it, it'll direct you to, it says, if you have questions, it'll give you that email. But it, there's a lot of, there's a lot of information on that too, about specifically about uh, uh, gardening in, in Dallas. So um, that's it. If anybody has questions or whatever, I'm happy to answer them. I uh, enjoy speaking with you all. Yeah, th thanks, Ruth. Uh, you know, this was like a, like a wealth of information that, uh, you know, like all of us would now like, you know, listen to. Even you know for the whole day, um, we, we we have a very good uh, mix of audience today. We had like you know some very uh, seasoned gardeners who have been like you know gardening for several years in the Dallas area, and uh, some of us have been like new to the Dallas area. So, um, thank you so much. You know, like a lot of the uh, information that you shared, I could like you know directly relate to, uh, especially some of the uh, vegetables that you showed, like the radish and. Uh, uh, okra and like some of those like very easy to grow and and uh, you know you you would find like not really, really like uh, think like you know, it's really difficult to grow but they are like not they are like really easy to grow i would encourage uh, all of our uh, uh, gardeners like you know who are listening to the show today uh, to try them out um, just as a as a uh, announcement uh, we will be sharing uh, some seeds uh, next week saturday uh, we have an event uh, february 19th in uh, Collin County College, um, it's in Frisco. So we are going to have a session there, like uh, not garden session, but a general uh, session. And we are going to be sharing some seeds. So all our listeners and members can collect our seeds there. 
uh, I want to give an opportunity to John to comment on this event and uh, wait for you to come on there. Uh, before that, like, let's ask, uh, let's open the uh, floor for questions. Uh, if, uh, if you have questions, like, please unmute yourself, ask a question and then mute back. Hey, uh, I have a quick question, actually. So we are doing like organic gardening for the past like four years. Uh, but like we are facing like a problem with like a rat and like a rodents kind of stuff actually. Is there any like uh, resolutions for it actually? Uh, could you repeat what you said? I mean... uh, so uh, we are facing like a, a rodent uh, issues actually. Because, oh. like, yeah, organic stuff actually. But uh, how to like overcome this issue? Is there any like uh, solutions kind of stuff? You know, it's kind of like for the squirrels, the only way I've known to, uh, to take care of it is to mechanically um, fence them off. Um, you know, if you can get chicken wire or something like that, um, that that's, that's, I've tried, I've tried, you know, there's a lot of organic ideas like using fox urine and stuff like that it has never, <laughs> they said using cayenne pepper on the tomatoes or whatever, and it, it, it does not work. The only way is you've got to, you got to find a way where the the rascals can't get in. It's all. It's the only thing that's worked for me. Yeah, but like, yeah, we, are I, doing like a, we are doing like organic farming, like more than like a thousand five hundred square feet area. But I don't know like how to cover up like all the stuff like with using of yeah. So last year uh, I had uh, bought a really big uh, rodent. I mean like cat, rat uh, trap. It's like a really big one and. Uh, on, on, a, on a daily basis, like you know, they say, like you know, it could trap up to like 21 uh, rats at the time. But really, like you know, in my experience, like I only got like you know one at a time. Uh, so and then like you know, take them. I, I hate killing animals, so I take them to a remote area and like release them off in the wild. Uh, and that I think had helped me. Uh, you know, I, I was in the same situation. Like you know, all my, especially the guards, like the ridge guard and like you know, the bottle guards, they would just like you know go and eat them like you no know, wild like you no know. so i i use traps like you know, i didn't i didn't want to kill them like you no know, i didn't want like you no know, uh kind of there's a trap like where it straight away kills like you know i didn't want to do that i bought a, a small cage kind of thing the trap and then like caught them and like transported them over so yeah there was a, a guy who is a master gardener he's passed away but uh, he lived just south of lbj and so he would trap the squirrels, you know, that I, I don't have trouble with rats so far. So that's why I'm, I'm not sure of the solution, but. Oh, actually like a couple of weeks before, like uh, uh, Rodents went to like my attic area. Uh, it was like a bite made like a heater pipe. So it, the water got leak and then like in the complete, like uh, in the inside of my home, the complete like wooden floor got like damage actually. So I'm going to spend for like around $15,000 to like, replace like my stuff actually. So. Oh, no. A lot of problems. <laughs> oh, that's really discouraging. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's what, like, we are worrying. Like, we want to continue for, like, this year or, like, we want, like, stop it, like, for the, like, organic farming stuff, actually. We are just, like, wondering. Uh, that's devastating. Yeah, other, other thing that I also recommend people do, uh, not do is, like, throw the kitchen waste in their garden or, like, try to do, like, composting using the garden, I mean, like, the kitchen waste. Uh, not to do that uh composting with like you know leaves like just like how you how you said like that is that is good but um, a lot of people like you know don't want to like throw away the kitchen waste so they instead like you know throw it on the in the garden i completely like you know discourage people doing that because those attracts rodents and so anything you can do to like you know uh, not attract rodents would be like really good for this sorry to hear that like you know you have to spend like Fifteen thousand dollars to like fix the home, uh, oh, but uh, yeah, rodents are a trouble. Yeah, that's what like uh, we are like worrying a lot actually. We just like, we are just like thinking about like whether we want to continue like for the the gardening stuff like this year. <laughs> Try traps. I think like the those could help. Oh, you. Immediately, I called like a pest control. Like this guy came right, so they also like charge me around thousand five hundred dollars like to fix for the. <laughs> I know your 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 tomatoes are going to be more than sixty four dollars. <laughs> oh, uh, let's let's ask for like you know people to ask more questions. Yeah, I, yeah, I have one, but I'm not an avid gardener. I've just started my gardening last year, but I have these rodent issues too. Uh, even in the winter, right? So I see it. It's coming uh, in my backyard. Well, I don't have anything in the backyard, so it is coming up over there. It is spoiling all the yeah the little stuffs we have the 
the mats and everything it is yeah it, it does damage to the and now i wish i had a better solution <laughs> <laughs> i don't have anything so i'm so uh, what uh, I'm, i'm worried like if i start gardening this year so what what is going to happen then no my best advice is like better like you can like call like any pest control guy to fix like any uh, any of the like holes in your home like at the like roof side actually okay just yeah, to make sure this coming from to... my neighbor's part i i saw that also so where and i couldn't help anything um <laughs> <laughs> just like yeah, yeah, like yeah, like I, I also, yeah like 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 someone told right i also against killing animals so uh, i don't want to Uh, have any bait like thing in my garden to have it removed right so it it eats there and it goes in somewhere it dies so i don't want to do that so yeah. let me try the trap so someone suggested the trap right so yeah, yeah i posted the link on it. traps also right that's so that is one of the stuff but better you can call like a pest control guy so they will come and like check it out like your roof roof area like where are the like any holes kind of stuff they will come and like arrest it actually mind be like they charge for like around 350 or 500 dollars actually Uh, even my my pest control guy told that you would keep baits so wherein i don't want to do that so that's why i'm just asking yeah because like uh, we just like gone through like a lot of issues like within couple of weeks actually that's what i said right uh, almost uh, like more than 15000 dollars like we are going to spend actually to okay. rectify all this issue because like uh, ours is like a new building it's not like old one it's like a four years building <laughs> Yes, mine is also pretty new. It's it's the same around. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hi, I have questions? a question. Um, like, uh, I'm planning to do a, a fruit trees and uh, some uh, plants like grapes, strawberries. So, uh, what do you suggest about planting a grape? because i'm new to gardening and uh, i'm just starting the gardening this year so do you have any suggestions for planting grapes um i i would say the most important thing is research the type of grape um and i know like when you grow, do grape they don't fruit the first year i mean it's kind of a long term project you've got to uh, establish a plant first so i think i believe the best time to plant them would have been earlier in the season too So um I I I don't really actually grow my own grapes so I'm not as knowledgeable about that. <coughs> so with respect to fruit trees uh you know like uh, personally I know like uh, I have a pear tree and uh, it gives a lot of pears uh and the pear I I got it from Home Depot and uh it it's it's really good uh the kind of uh, pear that I got uh but if you but you might want to do research on the pear trees and apple trees as well uh same with plum as well like there there are like you know varieties they typically need like two trees to actually like you know pollinate and have some crop uh but some of them are self pollinating varieties as well so you might want to research before buying the tree uh people here in my other friends like they have had good uh, luck with uh plums and uh uh jujube just like uh there's another kind of fruit which is a very nice tasty fruit uh peaches are like good success with those so those are the trees i would suggest as i mean i'm not like i said i don't i don't have enough space so i don't grow, i i usually don't talk about stuff i don't do myself but um if you it, you know i would shoot that question to the master gardeners to the uh, uh fig fig is also something that grows really well here Yeah, figs. Figs. Uh, my neighbor has a fig has a fig tree. Yeah, that, that's, yeah. Well, but she has trouble. The squirrels eat them all, <laughs> so you have to cover them if you, if you have rodents. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, I would if you if you're planning to grow grapes, I'd send, shoot a question to the to the Master Gardener Association. They they'd probably I'm not a specialist in that at all. I have sure, a question. I, I, I can do that. Thank you. I have a question related to root rotting issue especially on the bottle gourd vines so the vine grows full length and ready to flower and start producing uh and then all of a sudden root rots and then the whole plant dies 
have you noticed or experienced that or any idea what's the solution for that? Uh, no, not really. But I, I, I'll tell you one thing. I would stop growing the same plant in the same area because something in the soil is causing it. So, uh, you know, rotate where you grow it. Try, try it in a different spot. You definitely don't want to keep doing it in the same spot. That's where crop rotation is really important. Yeah, a couple, couple of things is going on there. Uh, is uh, One, there could be some pest, some kind of worm that is actually eating up your roots. And the other thing could be uh, too much water. So there could be like stagnant water, which you don't see on the top, but there is like water underneath. So you might want to like, you know, check the area where uh, water is like, you know, getting stagnant when there is like rain or like, you know, even when your sprinkler is running and your, all your water is like going and standing there. So you might want to check that as well. I, for this reason, I, I, I personally use like raised beds so that like, you know, I don't have to deal with like stagnant, stagnant water. Uh, so those could be the reasons. I see, I appreciate it. And the plant that died was in veggie bed, in a raised bed. Yeah, then probably uh, some kind of uh, worm. A raised bed really helps with drainage, you know, so, I mean, like you're, you're saying, like most plants don't like just sitting in water and that, that is a problem with our, our clay soil. So you might try it, try it in a raised bed or. Yeah. Sure, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any questions, more questions? So I had a question, uh, Ruth, like, you know, since uh, you're waiting for other people to ask questions. Uh, you mentioned uh, about uh, the planning of the of the garden, like, you know, um, you know the east and, uh, sorry, the north and the south and like all those things. Um, I think that's, that's a very good idea. Like, you know, I have always like, you know, told people like to do that. Um, in the other slide, you also mentioned about uh, rotating the crops. Uh, how would you group the crops? Like, you know, what kind of plants would you have in a specific area, and like, how would you rotate them? Um, what like, I do is, if I grow, I, I go by, uh, I go the, the plants that like tomatoes and squash. They're all from the same family called the Salacea family, and so you want to try to uh, skip a season with those. Um, so what I do is if I grow tomatoes in what one bed, then I don't, I don't grow them there the next year. I mean, like, and I'm talking about the community garden where I had a lot of space <coughs> in my home garden. I don't have space to do much rotation. So, um, I just have to, um, I, I just have to plan, you know, I try to tr a little bit, I can change it around a little bit. One, one thing I did one, one time is, um, I was having a lot of trouble with diseases with my tomatoes. So one year I, instead of growing them in my, my cage, you know, I was always growing them in there. I grew the tomatoes in containers to give the, give them a break from, from, uh, from, uh, you know, I skipped a year with them. So that, that's another idea. So, so if I had a tomato in, in one, one spot, like what kind of crop would you recommend planting in that spot? Next I would year? do, I would do like a, a green bean or a, a legume so that, um, so that you enrich because uh, tomatoes, you know, they need they need a lot of nitrogen, so that help enrich the soil. Uh, another question, like uh, if if anyone else uh, has a question, like please unmute and ask. Uh, but I'm going to keep asking questions. <laughs> so uh, you, you talked about uh, uh, mulching the mulching the soil with. Uh, with the leaves and and uh, straw and like all those stuff. Uh, so if I if I start, so this is a, I, I know the answer, but I'm just going to ask it for like the rest of the people. If if we start mulching, and then it's not going to like let the water. So if I'm like spraying water things, like you know using a hose, garden hose or something, is it not going to like absorb the water and like not let the water get to the roots? Well, um, usually before I lay down the mulch, I, I make sure I water everything really good. But it, it, it goes it goes through the mulch. It shouldn't be uh, it shouldn't be an impervial surface like the hay or or I use crunched up uh, leaves sometimes for my mulch. Um, it'll it, it gets through there. And again, the idea you want to try to you want to that's where drip irrigation is good is because it's right on the soil. 
<clears throat> One thing too to remember about mulching is you never want the mulch to be uh, adjacent to the stem of the plant too. So you, you kind of pull the mulch away from the from from where the stem is because so, that, that'll help bugs will hide in it and it'll get diseases. So but but no, the water gets through. I mean that's not that's not a problem. So another question related to preparing the soil itself for the for the gardening or for starting uh, starting to plant. Um, do, do you recommend like, you know, so a lot of the garden lawn guys and like, you know, people, they come and sell services to like, hey, we want to do the aeration for your, for your lawn, right? So uh, is that something that you would recommend for the vegetable garden to kind of like, you know, dig a little bit and like, you know, do some aeration? No, I, no what I do is I, every, every, whenever I change out uh, crops, I add more compost and I, uh, I kind of, you can you can kind of dig it in. They found that you really don't the soil structure when you when you they used to uh, um, you know uh, recommend that you hoe the area or, or um, you know but now they you don't want to destroy the soil structure so it's better just to add I, I a lot of times I'll just add the compost on the top and then when I plant the new plant under it um, then the uh, the compost gets added in or you can kind of stir it in a little bit but. But every time I switch out plants, I add more compost, and that's that's how, that's what aerates it. Just on the top, don't dig the soil, don't disturb the ecosystem. Just I, I, lay the compost. Most of the time, that's what I do now. I used to, yeah, I used yeah. to like dig it in, but the more I've learned yeah. about uh, not destroying the soil structure. Um, yeah. When, yeah, I mean, I, I mean like, you know, when you first prepare the soil, you've got to because it's just hard clay. You've got to you've got to uh, get in, get in order to get the compost in. If you want to do it, if another way to do it is what's called sheet sheet mulching, is you just keep adding layers on top. You add you add uh, you add a layer of hay, and then you add some vegetable scraps, and then you add you know whatever. That's another way to do it. That's another thing I like about where I bury the, my, I bury my scraps is that every time I bury it, I'm kind of uh, breaking up the soil a little bit. So that really, really my experience with that was the soil was really um, good. You know, it was real uh, uh, easy to work after I had done that the first season. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Um, yeah, I just have one other question. As uh, Ruth, you mentioned now that you um, layer the soils while preparing the bed. So you said like you're going to uh, bury some um, mulch or uh, the hay or something, and then you bury the uh, kitchen scraps, uh -huh. and then you build in the soil, top layers and everything. So um, does that invite the rodents and other pests if we bury the kitchen scraps? Yeah. Yeah. Like, my understanding is if you if you bury it deep enough, they usually are not attracted to it. Now, now you got to be careful. You don't want to use uh, any animal products. I mean, I just and I'm really careful about that. I only use like the tops of the onions or uh, the the you know the watermelon rind or you know you just you just you, uh, the rodents usually aren't as a, they're just like uh, little kids. They don't like vegetables as much. <laughs> I mean, but if you put chicken or something like that or uh, some kind of a animal grease or a, a dairy product in it, you're going to attract rodents. So my understanding is, and this, I, I don't have a whole lot of trouble with rats, but I, I always try to bury them into the compost or into the soil deep enough that the scent, they don't, they don't smell it. So. Uh, so my understanding, if I'm right, so as long as you bury those kitchen scraps, uh, the rodent don't smell them and they don't uh, trouble you, right? Well, I don't guarantee results, but that's what works for me. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I would, I would, I would completely stay away from using any kitchen scrap in the garden. You know, like, uh, yeah, don't, don't use it. Yeah, if you, if you're having trouble, if you, you already have an infestation, he's, Ro uh, rodents, yeah. That, yeah, I'm just saying what I do. <laughs> so, but I, don't, I haven't had a lot of trouble with rats. Go, go ahead, Aparna. Thank you. Uh, Ruth, I, I, I have I'm a question it. for you. First, thanks for this wonderful session, both MTS and to you. I have a question. When you said you you have some plants that you're growing inside the house under lights, can you share a picture of that? For me, I've always been unsuccessful. Transplanting what I have grown as seed starters from inside the home and planting them outside. Mine dies off or start life, they just fall off. Okay, well, what, one thing you're probably doing, which I mean, it's, you know, I'm, I'm retired now, so I have time to do this. After, after you 
what I do is I, I, I have to, they have to build up. Um, so like I, I, what I do, I start them in little seed starting trays mm -hmm. and then I, I pot them up into a bigger, once they get a, a they get a, their first leaf, real leaf, I pot them up into a bigger little pot. And then when they get, start getting ready to go into the garden, I, I, I take them out for a little sunning. I mean, I put them in a shady spot for maybe an hour and then I gradually, and then I bring them back inside. You have, they have to build up because what happens if you just stick them outside, they're, they're, they've been babied inside. They're not used to the wind. They're not used to the sun. So mm -hmm. you have to, it's called toughening. You have to toughen them up gradually. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a pain. <laughs> I mean, I, I, since I have time, I enjoy the pain. <laughs> so. Even when they grow their seeds inside, like sometimes when it is closer to the sun, it started having long stems. And then I think it probably doesn't have enough. And then the endless falls down. Yeah, I put mine under fluorescent um, fluorescent tube lights, or you can buy special grow lights online. I put them, they're directly, and I, they're like an inch away from the light. And I have them on a timer and they're on, I leave them on, the light on for 16 hours and then it goes off for the, the, the eight hours. So it's, it's, it's kind of, you, it's, that would be a whole nother course is seed starting, but um Again, if you have questions about this, you can you can write uh, you can email the master gardeners and they'll give you more more references. And, and uh, I mean, I could, I could come back and do a whole thing on seed starting, but that would be the <laughs> another hour or so. Thank you so much. That's a good question, and, and a lot of us like you know face that issue, uh, especially like you know beginners uh, do face that issue. Uh, one 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 thing like you know that I would I do like you know, sometimes is uh, if I cannot like you know take it out every day, leave it out there, and like you know, bring it back in. Uh, I would have a very small fan, like kind of like blowing air in like you know, different directions to kind of make the plant move so that it, it builds some amount of strength. Uh, so for the poor people, fan could be a little bit of a solution. <laughs> See, it's so much easier just to go to the grocery store and buy vegetables. <laughs> But it's not nearly as much fun. <laughs> it, it's time intensive, it really is to do this. So. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, John, are you there? It's been my pleasure. You, know, you, you guys are a great group. I'm, you're very, um, I appreciate uh, you. I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to unmute, ask uh, Dorothy to unmute, and uh, also John to unmute and uh, give some comments. Vitri, are you there? Okay, John, John had dropped out, dropped off the call, and I think Vitri had dropped off the call as well. Um, so thank you so much, uh, thank you so much, uh, Ruth and uh, Dorothy, like uh, for coming here to us today, uh, to, to our group, and like talking to us like about all this wonderful stuff. Uh, I have a quick request, probably like you know, people are going to be asking me after this if you would uh, be able to share the slides that you used today, so that we can share that with the. Uh, with it with our group and like they can use it as a reference uh for for the rest I, I, of the I season not, i prefer not to do that i'd, I'd rather not oh uh, you prefer not to do that okay yeah, oh, that, so, that's, that's but, fine. but i can't stress enough how much you can get any of the information i've given if you'll go to dallascountymastergardeners.org you know and ask them questions that you have so S sounds good sounds good yeah thank you thank you so much for coming and okay. uh, really appreciate it okay. bye thank y'all for your attention. I appreciate your good group. Thank you.